Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's video. I'm Pastor Matt, this is Pastor Adrian, and we pray this message blesses you and encourages you all throughout your week. Absolutely. For any more information on how to be praying with us or to become a part of our community or to give, please head on over to takeovergr.com. And thank you, Pastor Scott. Would you stand to your feet, take over church? I know Evan tried to sneak it back in last week. I love you, PE, but uh, I'm, I'm severely over the 10 second praise break. Instead, where I believe the Lord is moving isn't, isn't just an excitement. I think he's moving us into a place of reverence and awe. I think he's asking his bride to be awe-inspired by him again. So if you would, join me. Would you just lift your hands up like this, just in a posture of willing to both surrender and receive. That is the greatness of our God, is that when he asks us to surrender, we will always receive from him. He does not take without giving. He does not take without giving. And the best part is, whatever he takes from you or out of you, that is now no longer for you, he replaces with himself. So we just say, with arms wide open, we say, we want you, Jesus. Repeat after me. We want you, Jesus. We want you, Jesus. Make it personal. Say, I want you, Jesus. Say, I need you, Jesus. Here's my life, Jesus. Make much of it for your glory and your glory alone. I love you, Jesus. Come on, go ahead and praise him. Come on. We want him here, don't we? Amazing. Well, happy Mum's Day to all of the amazing mothers in the place with style and grace. And uh, we are all better because of you. Your prayers have sustained us. Your prayers have kept us. Your tears have clothed us and kept us close to God. And we love you and we thank you. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, as someone who doesn't come from a Christian home and was not raised in a Christian family and did not have Christian parents, I am so grateful for the spiritual mums and dads that I have had all throughout my life, including my in-laws now, who literally, who literally have taken in this orphan cub and have shed tears and, and spared no expense for my life to see me prosper in all things godly and holiness. Amen. And so I just want to say, if you're, a, if you're a mother in here and you have biological children, we applaud you. If you're a mother in here and you have spiritual children, we applaud you. And we just want to say thank you from all that you do. Amen. Come on. We love the moms. Oh, well, welcome to Mother's Day at Takeover Church. As you know, we, we don't thank you, Prophetess Angela, for all of these things. Um, but we, we do not curate sermons and messages around cultural things. We, we, we go where the Lord is leading us. Amen? And I don't know about you, but man, we, uh, we came into this place and the Lord just met us here. And maybe it's because Jesus really loved the mom that he had, that he gave an extra portion of himself in this room this morning to celebrate Mother's Day. But I don't know about you, but I didn't come here to allow the enemy to pillage this moment from us. I did not come here to lose a fight against the enemy. Instead, what I came to church today to do, and I hope you'll join me in this, is lifting my hands and sticking my heel on the throat of that serpent. And as he squirms, we make our praises loud. Amen. Amen. Come on. I know that may seem graphic, but it's the devil and I don't care. Yeah. Romans 16, 19 says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan and the God of peace will crush him under his feet. Come on, somebody. I came here this morning to crush the devil. I came here today to exalt God. And you know what I love real quick about holidays? This is what I love about holidays. And the Lord has really changed me because um, about five days ago, I would have came into this morning and would have saw that so many of our young people are gone with their moms and dads, which I understand. But I would have been depressed and I would have been sad and I would have been fighting battles and battling and battling intrusive thoughts this whole entire morning. But instead what the Lord has done and began to rework in Matt McClure is this, is that those on Sundays that are holidays or Sundays that are particular who still choose to find themselves in the house of God, it's not an indictment against those who don't, but it is a celebration of those who do. You are the hungry, you are the hungry, you are the hungry, and we are a church that are going to say we're going to feed the hungry, not those we wish were hungry. Amen. So it's not an indictment against anybody else. It's a celebration of you. And that tells me as your pastor, oh baby, I can let her rip today. 
because we're here for him and him alone. Amen. You could be anywhere else. If you're older in here, you could have been with your kids. If you're younger in here, you could have been with your parents. Today, you chose to be about your father's business, and I celebrate you. I honor you, and we're going to get after him. Amen. Amen. Come on, baby. Breaking it off. All right. Taking notes. We are continuing our year-long stewardship for a prophetic word coming out of Matthew 21, 13, which is Jesus proclaims the dream in his heart, the mandate from heaven, what his type of bride is. If you don't know, let me tell you, Jesus has a type and she is burning. She is on fire and she is intimate in relationship and found in a house of prayer. Amen. When God said, I'm going to design a bride for my son, she had to be able to keep up. And that's what we're given our whole entire year for, is to become a bride for him that is suitable, not just for his return, not for some faux rescue mission. No, 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 no. He's not coming back for an impotent damsel in distress. No, he is coming back for a blemishless, a blameless, a dazzling in white, and able to put up a fight. Come on, bride. I'm not preaching to anybody this morning. Come on, this is where we're going. So for week 19 of House of Prayer, the title of my sermon this morning is this, Hearing Unto Believing. Hearing Unto Believing. Hearing Unto Believing. And if you got your B-I-B-L-E with you, go ahead and open up to Isaiah 53, 5. Bless you. If you don't have it, bless you. It'll be up on the Sky Bible. Oh man, and I just want to say, Phil and um, Jen, thank you so much for just holding it down back there and and keeping up with the spontaneity of the songs and what the Spirit is singing. Man, I love your guys' gift that you're able to keep us in sync with what the Spirit is saying to our Levites up here. So just thank you so much. Thank you. We say thank you. And then everyone said, Pastor, quit singing. Um, All right. Isaiah 53, we're reading the whole kit caboodle, baby. 1 through 12. You ready? Come on. And I just got to say, this week was incredible, and uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second, but man, my spiritual father, um, and I got to say, I I didn't really, uh, I didn't, um, uh, I haven't had one of those since I was in high school. Yeah, I've had some pastors who have looked out for me and cared for me and, and gone the extra mile for me, but Oh, my spiritual father surprised me with, I mean, it's, it's an embarrassing, luxurious Bible that he wrote in, especially for me, and just saying, like, my fellow soldier in the faith and my son, guard the deposit in which has been entrusted to you. So I'm going to read from that forever and cry into it a lot. It's going to be good. Isaiah 53, 5. Here we go. Oh, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hid their faces. He was was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and he has carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that we brought, uh, that brought us our peace and by his wounds we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living. Stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put... 
he has put him to grief. And when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many his righteousness. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide for him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he has poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins of many, making intercession for all the transgressors. We're going we're gonna to approach the Lord boldly this morning. And we're going to ask him to illuminate Isaiah 53. Amen? Amen. Pray with me. Father, we love you. Father, we love you. I want to encourage you. Begin to get bold with your prayers. Begin to look up. Open your eyes and position your head. Let's, let, us, let us take on a divine imagination and let's pierce through the veil of this warehouse and our known world and let's begin to fixate on the throne of God. Father, we love you and we ask God that right now you would be in this room and this morning we just say, God, we acknowledge you. We acknowledge your greatness. We acknowledge your majesty. We acknowledge your beauty. We acknowledge all that you are, God. God, we acknowledge that no matter how low life gets, God, there is not a depth that you cannot meet us at. We acknowledge that no matter the heights we ascend to, there is no place higher than your throne. That this morning, God, we say, position us next to Jesus in heavenly places because we want to get a good look at you. We want to get a good look at you. This morning, God, I am asking as a son who has been blessed with what you've entrusted me with, God, this morning, that Lord, we just say, we didn't come here to hear Pastor Matt. No, we came here to hear you. We didn't come here to witness great worship. We came here to witness the one worthy of great worship. This morning, we ask, Holy Spirit, would you come? Reassert yourself in our lives and in the conversations we engage in. Holy Spirit, come. Nestle up in the crevices of our hearts, the areas we are not brave enough or courageous enough and we are too weak and yet to touch and we just say, come and breathe. And as you do, Holy Spirit, we will not look away even if we wince. We will keep eyes locked with you because we know what you cut away needs to go, but what you replace it with, that's our living hope. And so this morning, we will give Jesus our Lord our Savior, our King, all of the honor, all of the praise, all of the glory he is so richly due as much as we can earthly fathom in Jesus' mighty name of faith, the church said, amen. amen, amen. Hearing unto believing, hearing unto believing, hearing unto believing, ah. Like Pastor Scott said, we, uh, we had the privilege of being with our Radiant Network family, and if you don't know what that means, it's a lot of churches have denominations. Obviously, we're a charismatic, Pentecostal, snake-handling kind of church. It's on Tuesdays. It's just been me so far, but it's going really good. But we have a, we have a network instead of a denomination that we're a part of, and, and it's amazing, and we've been a part of it for some years now, and we get to gather once a year, and we come together as that network, and, and this year, Adrian and I had the privilege of taking part in a greater capacity and in building greater relationships with so many pastors, and man, it was, it was more than what we were allowed to do. Let me tell you this. What we were welcomed into was the greatest thing of all time, and it was to be not in a room with famous pastors, because the best part about any pastor in that room who might have some fame associated with their name, they don't know it. They haven't stopped for a moment to smell their own aura, as the kids say. They are too consumed with lifting up fragrances and incense unto the Lord. And so we got to sit underneath men and women of God who are literally trailblazing ahead the same path that you and I are running down with. And the amazing thing that Adrian and I got to take away from this week, beyond all that we learned, beyond all that was imparted to us, beyond all of the things that were associated with this week, the number one thing that we get to come back here and tell you is this. We've tapped the right vein. We're running the right race. And every single message that was preached, every single sermon that was given, every single song that was worshipped, every single thing that took place was literally a beacon from heaven saying, take over church, you've got it. Yeah. And you've got it young. And if you get it while you're young, you'll keep it while you're old. Yeah. 
preaching to anybody this morning. So I want to tell you we're on the right track. That so much of what the Lord has been speaking in this house was literally being spoken from mighty men and mighty women of God who have hundreds of years between them of histories and heritages and, and tears and prayers and victories and healings and deliverances and churches that have grown and churches that have come and churches that have seen God do great things in their city and in their generation between them and they're speaking our language. Let's keep going, amen? I say that because I need you to hear so you can believe this morning. I gotta tell you, it was also one of the hardest weeks of my life. I'm gonna spare you the details, but man, it was so incredibly hard. But can I tell you this? Heaven was authoring this week. Heaven was authoring this story. And when hell came to snatch it, when hell came to take the pen from our Lord and begin to rewrite a different story for Takeover Church, God went above and beyond via words of knowledge from pastors who don't even know us, beyond uh, people coming to us and speaking in visions that they are receiving from the Lord without even having really much of a conversation with us at all. What the Lord has been speaking over this house, friends, get ready. I know today is a holiday and I know it may seem thin in here, but let me tell you, just because it's thin in here doesn't mean that is thick right here. We are underneath an open heaven. We live in a thin place. The Lord has poured himself a hole right here where he can shower himself upon this church. Amen. So no, no matter what the devil tries to pull, whew, and no matter the plots of man, our God has the last word. Amen. And if you'll let him, he wants to have the first word. I'd much rather live a life where I give God the first word. <laughs> I ain't got to wait for him to put his foot down with the last word. Amen. But hear me, I love Isaiah 53. Now, I don't know about you, but man, when I was sitting with the Lord this week, all I could think about, all I could not, I could not fathom any other thought. I had like six sermons just bubbling up in me. And the Lord was just preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching. And I started writing. And he was like, it's not that one this week. And I started writing. He's like, that's not this one this week. And I'm like, Lord, what are you saying? And he says, Isaiah 53. And I was like, Lord, why? No, it's great. It's one of my favorite chapters. But I, I really need to ask him. I was like, why? He said, because this Sunday marks the day where we leave behind all of the no longer is it. No longer is the church blank. The days have gone by. They're not coming back. Today we detach from all of the fixing of the days of old. And we begin today fixating on the God of the ages. And from this moment forward, we will not go backwards and say, the church for all time has screwed this up. The church from all time got this messed up. Obviously, there will be times where we have to speak into what we're seeing in the church at large, absolutely, to make sure you and I are hearing the Lord correctly. But no longer are we preaching about what COVID exposed. Instead, we're going to begin preaching about solely what God is building. Amen. And when he told me that, I was like, of course. Because you know what Isaiah 53, uh, 53 is? Isaiah 53 is the gospel. Isaiah 53 is the greatest synchronized, distilled display of the gospel. And I don't know about you, but we have found ourselves in a place, and I'm I'm not going back on what I just said, but hear me real quick. We have found ourselves in a place where so much people are saying, go and preach the gospel to the lost. And I came to reassert the gospel's authority in Jesus' pride itself. The gospel isn't just for the lost, it's for the saved. Yeah. You need the gospel as much as they need the gospel. We need the gospel. Somebody say, I need the gospel. Need the gospel. We need the gospel because I don't know if you know this. There is no greater weapon on this earth than the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no weapon of mass destruction as great as the weapon of mass deliverance called the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no greater weapon in all of the earth than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I love this because, man, if we're going to begin to build him a house of prayer, then we've got to begin to be built like him in the house of prayer. If we're going to build him a house of prayer, we've got to begin to love the things that he loves about a house of prayer. If we're going to begin to build a resting place for the Lord, which is what we are, 
You can call us a church. You can call us a cult. I will tell you straight up, we're a resting place for the Lord. You want to know why? Because we aren't growing beyond the gospel. Because the gospel isn't simply go and reach. No, no, no. The gospel is come and become. Come and become. There's missional objects to it. But the main mission in the gospel is what, friends? To become like Jesus. I don't know if you understand fully, but if you don't know, let me tell you my heart. The gospel isn't the same as the Great Commission. The Great Commission is a part of the gospel, but the gospel is not the Great Commission. Because there's a lot of people who will embark on a Great Commission mission without ever first becoming like Jesus. See, we live in a time and place where we are so infatuated with doing things like Jesus that we completely bypass becoming like Jesus. There's a reality shift here that needs to take place in the church. There's a reality shift that needs to take place in the pursuit of our heart. There is a reality found in the gospel that doesn't simply enable you to behave like him, but actually gives you grace, power, and mercy as you become like him. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? That is the mission of the church. And so when he's, he's illuminating Isaiah 53 to me, I'm sitting here going, yes, Lord, I want the gospel to be alive in Matt McClure's life. If I got the gospel alive in me, I hope you have the gospel alive in you. If we got the gospel alive in me, we're going to have the gospel alive in this house. If we have the gospel alive in me, man, I am never going to allow that which is horizontal to disturb the greatest vertical impartation of all time, that being the seed of Jesus being placed on the inside of all of us so that we would be transformed and taken over from the inside out. I guess we're a full gospel church now. <laughs> if you don't know what that means, don't ask me. I get asked that all the time. You guys full gospel church? I'm like, we like all four of them. I don't really know what that means. So I love this because here is Isaiah, a great prophet. Isaiah is one of the best prophets. In fact, all of the um, prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, I mean, there's obviously some that are in Micah and Malachi and other places and Jeremiah, don't get me wrong, but I'm saying that the abundance of prophecies that were spoken about Jesus are actually found in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, an amazing prophet to Israel, and he fulfills every single one of them. I mean, it would be... I forgot the math of it and everything, but man, like there is a wild math equation that it would take for Jesus in the work of the flesh to achieve all of the prophecies 400 some odd years before he was ever even born. Like it's amazing. And so I love Isaiah. I love this book. It's a place that I go to and I rest often. And it's interesting because Isaiah in this moment, he is preaching and prophesying, are you hearing me, to the stiff-necked people of Jerusalem, to the stiff-necked people called Israel. And I believe in the same vein, hear me now, I'm not calling you stiff-necked. I'm simply saying the message that God was trying to get inside Israel in Isaiah is the same message he's trying to get inside you and I today. The interesting thing about, about Jerusalem and Israel at this time is that they were so stiff-necked that even when Isaiah was preaching to them about the coming Messiah, which was most of his messages, most of his sermons, most of what he spent his time was preaching about the one who is and is to come. And it's interesting that God is calling us back to a place of preaching about the one that is and is to come. So there's these stiff-necked people that just cannot seem to get out of their own way, fall out of love with themselves and fall in love with him. These people. And what's amazing here is Isaiah paints this perfect gospel picture of the coming Messiah, which should entice them which should call out to them, which should disturb them. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for a divine disturbance today. Yeah. I'm looking for a divine disruption today. I'm looking for a gospel to put itself before me and show me all that I am and all that needs to get lost. 
so I can be found in him fully. And so Isaiah is preaching this to them. And he literally, he starts off, this is so interesting to me. He says, today whom has the arm of the Lord revealed itself to? Who has the arm of the Lord revealed itself to? And this is interesting because the reality is this, friends, is that every time in Scripture we see the verse, the arm of the Lord, it is either about power or provision of God being presented to somebody. And so it's in this moment that Isaiah is preaching to Israel and he is saying, listen, whom among you today has had the arm of the Lord revealed to you? What's that first sentence say? Those that believe because they have heard. Those that believe because they have heard. Friends, can I ask you this morning, are you walking in power? Can I ask you this morning, has power been revealed to you? Can I ask you in all of your time, in a relationship with God, in the house of God, in the religion of Christianity, however you want to phrase it this morning, is there a power that's been revealed to you? Is there a power of which you partake in? Is there a power by which you partner with? Is there a power at work in your life based upon what you have heard? So therefore you believe. You want to know a really easy way to find out the answer to that question? You just look at your life. If you look at your life, you begin to expose whatever power is at work in your life. Because whatever greatest power at work in your life is, is solely determined by the greatest voice you heed your ear to. The most power in your life comes from the place you give most your ear to. So whose power is it, friends? Whose power is it? Who have you been listening to? Who have you placed your ear before? What's interesting to me is that, listen, friends, we were created in the image and likeness of God. And what did God do? He spoke existence into creation. He spoke light. He spoke stars. He spoke mountains. He spoke oceans. He spoke all of the cosmos to work together so that this little rock of ours wouldn't just survive, but it would thrive. That it would be a resting place for him, by the way. You think he made all these cosmos just for you? No, he made it for him, but he wanted to share it with you. Yeah, I preached to anybody this morning. Can I give you a word of power and a word of caution this morning? Watch your words. Watch your words. If I could be a dad for a minute, watch your mouth. I know it's Mother's Day, but let me be a dad for a second. <laughs> watch your mouth. Why? Because the word of God tells us that from your tongue, what? Life and death come. That life and death are found. The power of it, what you will reap from it, are found in your tongue. You know what that tells me? If you are speaking godly things, guess what you're doing? You're partnering with God and his godly things. If you're speaking evil things, you are partnering with the devil and his evil schemes. Are you hearing me this morning? And let me tell you, friends, the power at work in your life will be the result of what you've heard, therefore by which you believe, and what you believe, therefore you spoke. He says, whom among you have believed because you've heard and you have had the arm of God revealed to you. That's interesting. Because that means that it's actually possible for you and I to exist as a Christian. Okay, are you hearing me? To exist as a Christian and not have the power of God revealed to us, not have the arm of God stretched out to us. It's entirely po possible to claim to be a part of Israel, to be a part of the church, to be a part of the bride, but literally live a powerless existence. Yes. At least the power that you should long for. You see, so many of us, we can look at our lives and we can see the voices that we've heeded an ear to. We can see the voices all of a sudden. It's like I'm battling insecurities. Why? Because you're listening to demons. Yeah. Oh, I'm struggling. You're just so overcome with doubt. Why? Because you've been listening to the devil. Oh, I'm so overcome by perversion. Why? Because you've been listening to yourself. 
because you've been listening to culture, because you've been listening to the world, because you have given your ears over to demigods that would love to demolish your life. And I'm telling you this morning, if you think this natural world is all that there is and that God is the sole being who stands outside of it and there are not powers and principalities and dark places trying to rule over your workplace, rule over your family, rule over your schools, rule over your kids, rule over your marriages, let me tell you, friends, you are kidding yourself. Now is the time where the enemy is waging a full-blown assault against the church of God. Pastor, this is Mother's Day. Let me give you a Mother's Day gift. Let's be equipped in the most places of power we can be. Amen? Amen. Why? Because there is a whole onslaught coming towards you, coming towards your kids, coming towards your marriage, coming towards your future. Do you want to be found powerless and bending over? Falling down? having the floor go out, the bottom come out, having the enemy lay a snare for you, but because you weren't heeding God, you didn't see it coming? Or do you want to be found in a place, in a position where God's hand is outstretched to you, his power has been revealed to you, that you haven't just heard, but you've believed, you've not just seen, but you've heard. You see, it's interesting to me. Paul puts it like this two times. He says, we walk by faith and not by sight. And he says later in Hebrews, that we, or no, Romans, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You want to know why? Because your eyes will lead you astray. Your eyes will lead you astray. It takes very little faith to believe what you see because all of the effort has been done for you. It takes great amounts of faith to be led solely by your ears. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Oh, pastor, we want to see this. We want to see this. We want to see this. We want to see these miracles. We want to see these things. I do too. Problem with that is, if we're being led solely by our eyes, our appetites will be off. If we're being led solely by our eyes, our affections will be off. If we're being led solely by what we can see and not what can be perceived through our ears, friends, we will love the things in Jesus' hand that stretched out and not the face looking back at us. I preached to anybody this morning. The power of God being stretched out towards you. He's, he's got all of the gifts. It's all right here. But he's looking for a bride that's going to lock eyes with him on his wedding day when he puts the ring on her finger. The ring that opens all of the scrolls and all of the things to you and I pertaining to life and godliness. I ask you again, church, whose power is at work in your life? Is it the enemy? Is it the culture? Is it demonic resources and influences? Is it your own fallen flesh and motives? Or is it the word of God? Is it the word of God? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The amazing thing to me about this is that long before Jesus even stepped up to the plate, Isaiah was preaching 400 years before this, proclaiming that there was going to need to be a time and place where God established for himself a resting place, a dwelling place, a people who wouldn't be led by their eyes like Israel in Egypt, like Israel in the desert, like Israel trying to get into the promised land but falling over themselves. Their eyes didn't help them get out of the desert any faster. Their eyes didn't help them get to the promised land any quicker. The thing that would have got them, what should have took eight days but took 40 years, what would have got them there was what? If they would have listened to Moses. If they would have listened to God's oracle, if they would have listened to God's mouthpiece, if they would have listened to God's megaphone, if they would have went up on that mountain and sat in God's presence like he offered them to. Friends, this is who Isaiah is preaching to, and this is what Isaiah is preaching about. Whom has believed because they have heard? See what I find, (laughs) what I find next that he says is very interesting about Jesus. He says that he grew up before him. Jesus grew up before God. He grew up before him like a young plant 
even though he was rooted in dry places. Are you hearing me? He grew up before him like a young plant, a zealous, a fruitful, a bountiful, a luscious, one that produced great, big, massive, colorful, bold fruit. He grew up before him like a young fruit sprouting up even though he was rooted in dry soil. You know what that's interesting to me is this, because we live right now, friends, and so many of us, I know you because I'm your pastor and I'm coming to your front yard. So you might as well let me park it and we're gonna sit with it, okay? Some of us, your Christian life is being lived out out of the dry soil and not lived in front of the king of heaven. So many of us, we are living lives where we have found ourselves in a dry place. We're in a dry season. Our marriage is dry. Our singleness is dry. Our job is dry. Our friendships are dry. We're feeling that we are just stuck in the muck, in the dry, in the places that we can't get out of. And yet there's something about Jesus, whom is the image that you and I are being transformed into when? Daily, right? He's transforming us back into his image and likeness daily. So what is it? There's something about Jesus who is able to not give in to the dryness around him. You know what that tells me? It's because he wasn't consumed with the dryness around him. He was consumed with the one standing before him. The reality is this, you can find yourself in the driest of places, but if you will position yourself in front of the throne, you can't lose. If you will position yourself in front of the one, you're going, where's my fruit? Where's my life? Where's the words that were supposed to come to pass? Why isn't this church growing as fast as we thought it would? Why isn't the marriage coming? Why is my marriage not being repaired? Why are my kids not coming back to the Lord? Why are all these things not happening? Where's the job? I did the four years. I got the degree. Where are the things? Why are my parents not coming to the Lord finally? God, what is going on? And we sit here, we begin to make agreements with the driest places. instead of the one with the face of glory before us. Friends, I just want to tell you this morning, listen, listen, listen. Where you position yourself in a, in a dry season is more important than the dry season. Where you position yourself, whom you sit before. Friends, can I ask you, are you sitting in your dry season, or even though it's dry around you, are you positioning yourself to sit before the king of majesty, the king of glory, let me talk to you real quick. Listen, if you're a married person in here and you are struggling, you're like, my marriage is dry. God, where are you? Why am I not getting the affection from my husband, the affection from my wife that I feel like I see in the scriptures that is depiction of a godly marriage? If that's you in here, I've got good news for you. It doesn't matter how dry your marriage gets. If you're not consumed with the dryness of your spouse, but you're consumed with the glory of your king, God will break in on your spouse. I preached to anybody this morning. Yes. You get consumed not with sitting with the dryness, but sitting before the king. Yes. Oh, if you're single in here, I'm coming for you next. Oh, so many of us. It's dry. I'm in a church. They're young, but there's no single. Oh. It's dry. Can I tell you this? Can I tell you this? You become consumed with sitting before the king. And you let that season stay dry as long as it can. As long as God wilts. You stay fixated on him. Because the bottom line is some of you You've not been sitting before the throne. You've been sitting on your phone and you've been sitting there on dating apps that you're going to meet somebody who isn't found in Christ in the first place and because they're not found in Christ in the first place, they will leave you high and dry at the end of it. So guess what? You find someone in the dry places, guess what happens? You get a dry marriage. But let me tell you this. I come from a different era, okay? I really do. We were a different breed and let me talk to you real quick because it's kind of funny and kind of embarrassing but I think it's right. We come from a time and place. Listen, when I was young and I was dating and I was stupid. You know me by now. Okay, it's amazing that I haven't run God off from this place yet, okay? When I was young, dumb, and stupid, and I was dating, there was these girls. 
And it didn't matter the lines you said, didn't matter what you had, didn't matter how you were going on. It didn't, didn't even matter the Bible verses you remembered. I couldn't fool them. They weren't about that life. They had discernment, okay? And I was like, oh, all right. Discernment, like get out of here. Um, and uh, literally, I remember asking a girl one time, and I don't have many stories, but this is actually, I think, brilliant. She goes, actually, I don't have time to date you. I'm dating Jesus. And it's interesting because there are so many memes today. People make fun of the purity culture. There's all of these things. And I'm not saying there wasn't stupidity and harm back then that wasn't done right. I'm not excusing some of the things that happened in that time period. But what I'm telling you is this. The women who told me, I can't date you, I'm busy dating Jesus, they didn't marry no sinful bum. They stayed found seated in front of Christ no matter the dry season and circumstances, the dry landscape ahead of them and around them. They stayed fixated on Jesus. And what happened is, as they dated Jesus, a man would have to search God to find her. A man would have to search, a woman would have to search God to find him. There was something about sitting before Jesus and Jesus alone. Can I tell you this morning, if you're single in here, this isn't a dating thing or a marriage thing. It's just a part of the scriptures. If you're single in here, some of you, you need to delete the dating apps from your phone this morning. As you know what you need to do? You need to start dating Jesus. And you want to know why? Because how good would it be if you took your Bible on a coffee shop date? What if you decided, I'm longing to go on long walks on the beach. Help me take your Bible. Yeah, but I want somebody to take me out to a fancy dinner. I want to dress to the nines. I want to just get dialed up and be treated like that. Okay, book a rever reservation, dial yourself up, get some doves to release behind you when you arrive, and bring your Bible to that fancy dinner. How much would God feel honored if you began to date him? So many of us in our Christian lives, man, we live flirting with Jesus but never marrying him. Yeah, and I'm telling you, he's into courtship. You want to know what that's called? Being yoked with him. Because you have to be yoked before you're married. So some of you, friends, I got to tell you this morning, ooh, I came to sit in your front lawn. I'm going to open my Bible in your front lawn. I'm a cracker root beer diet, of course, and we're going to talk about this. Because this is the reality. How honored would God look at you and go, look at this. Even that guy who took notice of her reading her Bible, she kept steadfast focused on me. It wasn't a fishing lure. She's not being a fisher of men. She's being a prioritizer of Jesus in this moment. And if this chump is actually worth anything, he will pursue her past this moment. She will pursue him past this moment. This is the reality. So many of us, we have lived our lives living out of being planted in the driest seasons. And what we're failing to do is prioritize sitting in front of the throne. He says, Jesus grew up like a young plant. Friends, can I ask you this morning, what's the fruit of your life? What's the fruit of your life? What kind of plant are you? If God is looking down right now, which we know he is, and he is looking through your cosmetics, he's looking through your presentation, he's looking through $500 Bibles and goat skin, he's looking through all of the things that you could accumulate and buy and pass off on your own, what does the fruit of your life look like? Does it look like a fruit that is living out of the driest places? Or does it look like Jesus who sprout up like a young plant as he grew before the Lord? You see, what's interesting about Jesus is it wasn't just in heavenly places in perfection where he was sitting before the throne, but it was in earthly places in the middle of imperfection that he still chose to sit before the throne. So what does that mean for you and I? We've got to be like Jesus. We've got to become like Jesus. This whole idea of being a house of prayer is our lives pursuit of not just doing Christian acts, but becoming like the Christ, of sitting there and not allowing the desert places to impregnate us with doubt, to burden us with friction, to come and attack us and terrorize us in our dreams, to not give in to the demonic that hangs out in graveyards, but instead, no matter where we find ourselves, positioning ourselves before the throne. Positioning ourselves before the throne. Some of you, 
you are living lives out of bone graveyards. And instead of prophesying to the dead bones because that's what you see and hear God doing, you've made your bed in the valley. And that's where you've lived and that's where you've slept and that's where you've remained. And I came to say today, awake, O sleeper, and get close to Jesus again. Awake, O sleeper, and get close to Jesus again. Awake, O sleeper, and get close to Jesus again. He grew up like a young plant before him. Are you growing? Are you growing? Are you stuck in the same sin? Are you stuck in the same mindsets? Are the problems that you had last year the same problems as you had the year before? And as <laughs> the enemy would have it, it's still the problems you have in 2024. Are you hearing me? How are you growing? I can tell you how you're growing based upon <laughs> where you've sowed yourself. Have you sown yourself before the throne of glory or have you sown yourself into the desert places? Have you sown yourselves into the throne room of heaven or have you sown yourself in the valley of dry bones? Where have you sown yourself? Because I gotta be honest this morning, I can't sow you where I wanna see you reap. I can only preach and prophesy to you and hopefully you begin to feel the nudge of the Holy Spirit convicted enough to sow yourself in the right places and in the right ways and in the right manner. And we see this fruit that looks just like Jesus come about in our lives. What's interesting is the very next statement that Isaiah makes. The very next statement's very interesting. Because for us as Takeover Church, man, we sing it all the time. It's probably my favorite worship song ever written. Uh, it's completely usurped all of the other ones. I can sing it all the time. I fall more in love with Jesus every time I do. It, it gets me right where I need to go when I need to get there. And it's Jesus, you're beautiful. It's Jesus, you're beautiful. And I love singing about the glory of God. I love singing about the beauty of God. I love preaching about the, the magnificent and majesty and perfection and holiness of our God. I love singing about his set-apartness. I love preaching about how he is holy but welcomes us into it. I love the fact that Jesus is beautiful. Can I tell you the number one young plant killer in this church, I'm not talking about the church, I'm talking about this church, you, me, the number one young plant killer, the fruit stealer, the little fox that gets in this room and begins to eat, 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 eat all the vineyard away before you get a chance to experience the new wine that God has for you. Do you want to know the number one? Is that we share in the same thought that Israel has. We don't see Jesus as beautiful. You wanna know how I know? The fruit of your life tells me so. Pastor Matt, this is a hardcore for a Mother's Day. That is the only way to do Mother's Day. I wanna return you to your mother looking more like Jesus, the son she deserves, the daughter she deserves, amen. amen. Come on, you're gonna to leave today with eyes of fire and they're gonna be like, what is going on? You'd be like, Jesus is Lord, repent. See, what's interesting about what Isaiah says, so many theologians, they've taken this and pastors alike, they've taken this and they've decided that he goes, there is nothing about Jesus that you would be attracted to him, that you would think he is attractive. There's nothing about him. He has no discerning qualities. There was nothing about him aesthetically and cosmetically that you would think he was this kingly presence, that he was this holy man that he was this set-apart being out of all of creation, the only son of God. There was nothing about him, Isaiah is saying, but that's not where the sentence ends. He says, there's nothing about him that you find attractive. There's nothing about him, Israel. There's nothing about him, takeover. There's nothing about him, church of 2024, the year of our Lord. There's nothing about him that you find attractive so all the theologians are saying jesus was ugly jesus was this jesus had moles and whatever else and it's like maybe but i think there's something deeper that's being said here the the emphasis is not on the fact that jesus was unattractive the emphasis is on the uh, the emphasis is found on the fact that israel had broken attractions 
Can I tell you today that downtown at Rumors is not the only place that has broken attractions in our city? but it's actually found in the house of God. It's actually found in our house of God. It's actually found in the family of God, and it's found in our family of God, that you and I, we actually have broken attractions. And it's a broken attraction to Jesus. We need a hard reboot on what you and I find attractive in this world. Can I ask you, do you love the ways of Jesus? Are all of Jesus' ways beautiful to you? Even when he comes to cut and prune and take away, even when he removes a relationship, he breaks an impending marriage, he does all of these things and he just takes away certain things that you thought were for sure your future. Do you find those moments of mercy and grace beautiful the way he does? Because this is exactly what Isaiah is preaching about. Isaiah is saying there is nothing about him that you find attractive. But all of heaven says he's the darling of heaven. All of heaven delights in him. All of heaven cannot quit singing, holy, holy is he. You and I, we have broken attractions. There is a brokenness on the inside of us that only Jesus can actually fix. Where you and I, we begin to look at his ways. The ways that puzzle us. The ways that disturb us. The ways that upset us. The ways where we kick and scream like a small child who didn't get the toy they wanted at Walmart that day. Listen, I am telling you. Downtown is not the only place with broken attractions. In this room, there are broken attractions. And I know this. I know this because of how long and how much and how willing we are to sit before him. So many of us, we go, why do my prayers not have power? Why am I struggling with these same sin cycles and these same issues? Well, it's probably because you thought that two hours on a Sunday would be enough to build yourself back up to a place where you wouldn't just stay and remain where you were, but you'd actually be able to fight and swim upstream, up current against the enemy's ploys, against your temptation in your flesh, against all the things that are coming against you. You thought the amount of time you spent in the flesh could be usurped by simply two hours in church when you're not even attracted to Jesus. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? I know it's a hard word, but I need it myself. I'm telling you, there are things in your life that you thought, if I came and praised for two hours, the whole entire curse would be reversed. And it's like, no, because you've delighted in years of sin, years of perversion. And you really haven't found Jesus attractive even for one moment. Even for one moment of pure, absolute, unadulterated, just awe. Look at how beautiful he is. Look at who he is. There is no spots on him. He is blameless and glorious. He even has scars and coming from them is the radiance of light and joy that he endured the cross for me. That I can look into his eyes of fire and I can see perfect thorn torn scars in his forehead. That he kept when he was glorified and given a new body upon his resurrection and ascension. Why? All to tell all of creation and all of history and all of future and all of future past. My word remains. Look at how beautiful he is. There's nothing about him that we find attractive. It's because we have a broken appetite. He says, hunger and thirst for the Lord. And those who hunger and thirst for the Lord, well, they will be fed. They will be fed. And yet we often live in a time and place where we're not getting better, we're getting bitter because we go to Jesus not in love with him. And because we're not in love with him, we're we're disappointed with what he gives us. And when we are disappointed in what God gives us, instead of delighting in what God gives us, it doesn't make us better, it makes us bitter. And then when people are supposed to taste and see that the Lord is good, they should be receiving crumbs from your table that you have had the best meal of your life for every single meal of that day. But when you don't delight, but you disappoint in what God has given you because you're not in love with him the way he's in love with you, well, they don't taste the goodness of God. They taste the bitterness of you. (sighs) 
Friends, beloved sons and daughters of the Most High God, this is, this is more than just preaching. This is more than just a message. This is more than just a sermon. Friends, I am prophesying to you right now and I am asking for the Spirit of God to rise up on the inside of you where you start to believe that which you hear here. When you start to believe that which you hear, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The reason some of you don't believe what Jesus believes is because you've not positioned yourself in front of Jesus to hear him. I am telling you, there is a total different you on the other side of your time at the feet and mercy of the king. Even if you find yourself in the driest soil, the most uninhabitable places, valleys of dry bones, heck, if you find yourself plummeting down the Sheol, you can still pursue the Lord. And I'm telling you, there's so much more in this gospel than a moment of who wants to give their lives to Jesus and we just shoot it up without wearing out the fact that we are actually going to give up full ownership and relinquishment of our lives to this king that solely leads us by hearing. Friends, we need a reboot of our affections. We need to be, have a reboot, a hard resetting of our appetite. Our lives and the witness thereof are completely predicated upon what you and I find attractive and what you and I are feasting on. There should be a reality in your world. You got prodigal kids, you got kids that don't know Jesus. There should be a reality in your world where when they taste from you, they experience you, they experience the goodness of God because you've not been sitting in the dry soil that they're prodigal. Instead, you've been sitting before the one son who could never be and you've let him change you. You've let him make you like him. You know what calls the prodigal's home? The one son of God. This is the reality of Isaiah 53. It's the gospel message. Because what happens next is this. Isaiah points this out, and I know it's Mother's Day, and he, we've got things going on, but I think Jesus has a little bit more, and I'll call the worship team up in just a second. But, but in this moment, it says, in fact, you find him so unattractive that when he's going to appear, you're going to veil your faces to him. They don't veil their faces because he's so ugly. They veil their faces because he's so beautiful, but they're still in love with their ugly. They veil their faces because they can't be bare to be seen next to something so glorious. Their spirit is crying out, that is the Lamb of God. But I'm still in love with myself. See, the reason we come to the church and we veil our faces, I'm not talking about wearing hats and headdresses. Some of us, we come into church and we just sit without talking to anybody. Some of us, we come into church and we just stand there like the chosen frozen. Some of us, we come to church and we don't engage with a thing, single thing that God does. And it's because we came into this place not falling out of love with ourselves. Friends, I got to tell you, until you fall all the way out of love with yourself, you can't fall all the way in love with him. I'm being serious right now. You will continue to live a veiled life in these doors and in this community and in your marriage and in your dating and in your singleness and in your job and in your kid's life and all the things. You will continue to live a veiled faith, not out loud, not being able to be changed by the glory of God. Some of us, we come into a meeting like this where God himself attends the meeting and yet we leave the same as we came in. Why? Because we veiled ourselves to him. Some of us, we leave emphatically different, radically different every single week. He comes in and he changes us from the inside out. Even if we got into some sin in the week before, his grace and mercy pours out on us because we come unveiled before him. The problem is some of us still think how we came in was beautiful. We're still attracted to who we were at 957 when we came in. Instead of 1037 at the peak of worship where we are ascending the hill where we are top thrill dragster going up to heaven and we are getting a look at the most beautiful one in all of existence we veil ourselves 
Haven't you ever wondered how you can come to a church and be a part of a community like this and live in a place like this and do these things and yet not fall in love with Jesus the way your pastors do? Can I tell you, I'm nothing special. I am the chief sinner among us. I am an orphan. I am less than you. Okay? And I'm telling you this morning, anything that God's done in my life is purely the result of man. I needed him more than I needed anything. I wanted him more than I wanted anything. I didn't have anything, and he gave me everything. Are you hearing me? This is what he wants for every single one of us. We're not going to continue to show up where we're still in love with what happens Saturday night and in love with what's happening Sunday morning. Some of us, we are more equipped to go to the club on Saturdays and we do more physical expressions for the sinners than we do for the one true living God. Some of us, we have lived in ways in our past where we worship Satan, the prince of the air, because we didn't know any better. And we've worshipped him with our bodies and we've worshipped him with our sexuality and we've worshipped him with all of our words and our thoughts and our actions. And some of us, we have lived crazy, outlandish, radical lives full of sin on display for the kingdom of darkness. But the second we came to know the king of glory, we lost our personality, we lost our zeal, we lost our enthusiasm, we fell out of love with him, still being in love with ourselves, but knowing we're bound to Christ. And we live prophetically and pathetically disgruntled in the kingdom of God. I appreciate anybody this morning. Y'all hate me yet? Worship team, you can make your way up here. This, but stay with me. I know they're moving. One day the Lord's going to give us a building, never a green room. We're never going to have a green room. Sorry, worship leaders. You're not that important. We're never, they don't, they're not that way anyways, guys. Come on. Amy and everybody, they, they do a good job of sniffing out the green room Christians that come here. You want to know why? Because they don't come back the next week. Because they know we're not about that life. As Pastor Evan would say, we're not about the green room. We're about becoming a green house. You know what I'm saying? I just dab for PE. That's hilarious. I got to buy time before they come up here and make me sound spiritual. This is where I want to land the bird today. This is where I want the dove to come and rest on us today. There's so much more, and I'm just going to kind of crunch it all together like the accordion sound of the trumpets of heaven. But what he goes on to say next is he talks about Jesus being crushed for our iniquities and broken for our transgressions, and that it's by his stripes we are healed. I want to tell you this morning that we live in the place with the most churches per capita in our entire country, but I would say we have the greatest deficit of faith in all of our country. That's not me dunking on every other church. That's me simply saying that because of the Reformed community and what their doctrine and theology believes, they have heard that God is no longer able. So therefore they believe that God is no longer able. So therefore they live thinking God is no longer able. So what do they not do? They don't pray. They don't seek. They don't burn. They don't fast. We live in a time and place that has literally had self-infliction upon itself, taking itself out of all that God has not spared a single ounce of pain towards his son for you and I to possess. If you look at this, he says, he was crushed for our iniquities. What are our iniquities? Our immoralities. Our sin. He was crushed for all of the things that make us no longer adequate. We are now inadequate to be counted as sons and daughters of God, but he was crushed for those iniquities. What does it say next? He was, he was broken for our transgressions. What are transgressions? Trespassing. It's our violation of the law. It's because we were so sinful that we could keep the law on our best day with the best sleep, with the best wife, with the best husband, with the best job, in the best town, with the best soil, in the best trees, in the best everything. We could do it on our own. And so he was broken for our transgressions, our violations of his law. Can I just tell you, the law is actually beautiful. The law is a marriage covenant that says, this is how you and I, we stay intimate. This is how you and I, we stay close. Jesus fulfilled the law. Praise God for that. But I would really like to rip off the bad taste that the law of God has in the Christian church today. 
That was a beautiful thing that he gave to Moses that he brought down to his people, making his first attempt to regain that which was taken from him by our hands. It's beautiful. We're not under the law, brother. Are you telling me you want to go have adulter, adulterer affairs and murder people? <laughs> it's not beautiful. I love that he cared enough to tell us how to be close to him. I love that he cared enough about us to tell us what's going to rip apart our soul from the inside out. I love that he cares enough about us to say, no, 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 don't go down there. It leads to destruction. I know it looks fun. I know it looks glamorous. I know you'll get the clicks. I know you'll get the likes. I know you'll get the fame. I know you'll get the house. I know you'll get the keys. I know you'll get the money. I know you'll get the spouse and 2.5 cars in Rockford. I know. But it leads to destruction. Most importantly, it leads you away from me. Because away from him is destruction. But what I really love about Isaiah 53, 5 in particular is this. We live in a time and a place that has said the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was only a sin atoning moment in history. Friends, I say that's a lie. I say that's heretical. I say that it's not what God came to accomplish solely upon the cross and crushing of his son. Because we just saw the first one. What? Our iniquities, our inadequacies, the things that broke us off, our sin and our immorality. He saved us from that with his crushing. And then what does he do? By his brokenness, he saves us from our law violations. What does that mean? He was broken so that we could be brought back into right standing. So he covers our sin. He brings us close. And then what happens? It says, by his stripes, we are healed. That word healed is a Greek word, sozo. It means body. It means soul. It means spirit. It means mind, mentally, spiritually, body, everything you can think of. The fullness of healing and restoration for you. And so we live in a place that we've preached it the other way. And so therefore we only believe the other way and we only have faith for the other way. And we wonder why revival hasn't come to Grand Rapids yet. It's because we got people believing only what they've heard. They haven't heard that his stripes, oh, they're big enough and they're deep enough for all of you, all of me, and all that comes along with you. The stripes on his back are big enough for legs. Would you stand? The stripes on his back are big enough for cancer. The stripes on his back are big enough for mental illness. The stripes on his back are big enough for suicidal thoughts. The stripes on his back are big enough for autism and Down syndrome. The, uh, the stripes on his back are big enough for every sickness, for every possession, for everything the enemy has tried to steal, kill, and destroy from your life. His stripes are big enough and deep enough and bloody enough for your bloody mess. we start believing what the Lord is saying you want to know why you don't have prayers that are being answered are you praying what you've heard every single person that Jesus healed believed he could every single person that Jesus pardoned believed he could every person Jesus delivered believed he could and if there was a hiccup he says Lord I believe now help me with my own belief Every single thing Jesus ever did, kingdom oriented, that went against all of our earthly vessels, it was because the recipient believes what he believes about himself. It's because the delivered believed he was beautiful. It's because those that were healed believed he was beautiful. It's those that were saved. Every person Jesus saved believed he was actually able to save. Why? Because they heard. And we're in a church that believes in miracles and the gifts of God and and all of these things. And we're going, God, you said in your words, signs and wonders would follow those that believe. Well, how did they follow them? They believed. How did they believe? They heard. They heard about the goodness of God in the land of believing, of, of the land of whatever the word is. That one. They've heard about the goodness of God in the land of living. They've heard about being able to sit before the throne in the desert lands. They've heard about this Jesus whose stripes were so big and so deep and so red with love that he can bore all. 
And when he bore all, he could make all right. I came to proclaim to you right now, if you want to kill the lights, go for it. We're going to get to a moment of intercession, praying for ourselves. We're going to approach the throne of God boldly, and we're going to begin to pray over ourselves. But not yet. I'm going to invite you up to the altar, so just get ready. And when I say invite you up to the altar, I'm saying it's not your decision. Everything, I came to tell you this this morning, everything God has given to Jesus, Jesus has given to you. Everything God has given to Jesus, Jesus has given to you. He says it all throughout his testaments. He says it all throughout his gospels. It's throughout the emphatic word of God. Everything God has given to Jesus, he has now given to you. Are you hearing me? The relationship Jesus has with God, he's given to you. The ear he had to the Father, he's given to you. The heart he had for the Father, he's given to you. The the eyes to see how beautiful he is, he's given to you. The long-suffering nature of Christ, he's given to you. Everything Jesus possessed that was poured out on that cross, that was broken apart, he has given to you. Chris, you can break the rules, come forward. Everything God has poured out from Jesus has been poured out onto you. And I need you to believe that today so you can start living that today. So that the lost and dying world around us can be the recipients of that today. So that you and I can see legs grow out, hearts get healed, cancer disappear, wheelchairs get left behind, orphans become family. The lost and discarded finding a home in the kingdom of God. Those who have never heard the gospel being brought into the kingdom. The product was coming home. The marriage is getting restored. Adultery getting rolled back to the most intimate marriage you've ever seen. The single person taken and rescued out of perversion and brought into a life of purity that sets a college campus ablaze for the glory of God. I'm going to finish with this and then we're going to pray. Isaiah says this. I will make for him, as in God, God will make for Jesus a portion. And in that portion, he will divide the spoils. He will divide the spoils among who? The weak? No. The broken? No. Who does he divide the spoils with? The strong. And the best part about this strength is this not found in your own might or in your own hands. It's found by the Spirit of God. And this is the reality. There is a spoil that God longs to disperse in this room for this city, for this region. You can look around and you can say it's Mother's Day and we are few. Jesus has done more greater things and more feats of glory in the earth with far less than what we have in this room today. Difference is those few partook in the spoil what are you going to partake in today what are you going to partner with today where are you going to eat today what soil are you going to live out of today friends this is a reformation of hearing about the greatness of God believing the greatness of God And if I can be frank with you, receiving the greatness of God because you will never receive from him that which you haven't heard and that which you don't believe. The best part is he tells you. So your belief isn't fake and it's not manufactured. It's spoken to you, given to you. So you can believe it and you can receive it. I'm not talking about prosperity doctrine. I'm talking about the gospel. So I invite you first to come forward. And the worship team is going to sing. And you can stay up here as long as you feel like it. But I would tell you this. Grab a friend. Some of you guys are here today. And you don't have families to go and celebrate with. Meet them at the altar. If you know that you've got a friend here that's alone today. Bring them to the altar. I'm talking babes with babes and boys with boys and just ganging up on the Lord together in this moment and saying I want to hear from you
I want to believe in you. I want to believe what you're saying. I want to listen. I want to see the tongue between your lips. I want to see it move as it comes my direction. I want to lean into all that you are speaking to us this morning. I want to hear unto believing this morning. I appreciate anybody. Then I'm going to pray. And I invite you up. And we are going to intercede for ourselves to hear so that we can believe and believe so that we can receive. Father, right now as they come forward, come forward. I'm going to get down there too. Father, right now I ask. I ask right now, God, that you would break our attractions. That you would break our appetites. Oh God, some of us, we have a relationship with you where we're not feasting on the bread and body of your son every single day as we consume things. And we wonder why our body and our lives and the realities among us are not agreeing with us. We have prophetic and spiritual upset stomachs, God. And it's because we are consuming things that are poison, things that are heinous. Because we have broken attractions. We have a broken definition of beauty. We have a broken appetite, God. We've lived so long on spiritual junk food of internet preachers, of clips to keep us going throughout the day. Instead of having a full meal before the king, we've consumed the crumbs of others' anointing. God, this morning we just say we repent. We repent for turning off our ears. We repent for being found in places in an agreement with people, God, who do not speak the true gospel of Jesus. We repent, God, that we have settled for a life with you that requires less faith instead of more. We repent of being led by our stomachs, of being led by our eyes, of being led by our hearts, and not being taken by the ear. Oh, he's gripping ears this morning. Grip their ears, God. God, I pray that you would grip, you would grip Julie by the ears, God, so that Thailand would look more like heaven. Oh, I pray that you would grip Matt by the ears, God, and that you would whisper to him. You would whisper to him, God, not some life-altering moments, but you would be the father to that person that he never had in the natural, God. You would speak purpose. You would speak destiny. You would speak hope over him in Jesus' name. Oh, God, I pray right now. I pray right now you would grip Cole by the ears, God, that you would push back that amazing flow of hair, and you would grab him by the lobe, and you would speak future into his life, ministry into his life, serving into his life, serving his wife into his life, of leading him and Maya to the Bible, to prayer time, to worship God. Oh, God, that you would, that you would lead Maya, God, by the ear in her prophetic destiny as a prayer warrior for Gen Z. God, that broken and dying generation could look at the life of Maya and see what she was and now who she's become and who she's becoming is even greater still. God, grip her by the ear. God, grip joy by the ear and tell her you're, you're her joy. You're her joy. You're her joy. Oh, God. Oh God, oh God, oh grip us God, grip us God, take us by the ear like you've taken Peggy by the heart God, and we just honor her as an interceding, interceding prayer warrior God, in hidden places, shifting things in the kingdom that can only be seen in the heavenlies God, but she has dedicated her life to the intercessor prayer life God, that few know about, but many are the recipients of, and I pray that you take generation of women and men in this room you grip them by the ears like you grip Peggy by the heart God yes God father that you would grip Kyle by the ear and you would grab that young man by the ear but not like a thrushing father not like a belligerent man 
but you would grab him by that ear like a son is being looked at affectionately by his father who grabs his face and says, I am proud of you and I want you and I've got a hope and a plan and I have got evangelism on your life and the reason you are the way you are in my glory is my purpose for your life. What you desire, Kyle, is not an avenue to run away down. But it's actually the hill you're called to plant your flag here at Takeover Church and be grown into an evangelist that is out of this house. He's not calling you away. He's calling you up. Oh, God. Lord, would you just grip Laura by the ears right now? which is fitting because she loves you so much and she prays day and night for her two deaf sons ears to be opened up God right now Lord right now Lord Laura this is going to sting a little bit your son's ears opening up are on the other side of your ears opening up to the fullness of God not just of what you can receive from him but what you receive just by sitting with him what he receives from you by you being his presence he says don't Pursue me for what I'll do for your boys. Pursue me for what I want to do with you. And we will take care of your sons. Open up your ears, Lord. I want to speak to you. I want to be the husband to you that you've been praying for, that you've been crying for, that you've been asking for. God the Father is saying, I love you, Laura. And I always have, and I always will. And I just want you to love me the way that I love you. Oof. Oof. Somebody put their hands on Becca. Somebody put their hands on Becca. Becca, God's gripping you by the ears right now. You may be marrying Hamza. You may be entering into a marriage where, yes, he is the head. But God is calling you into a great woman of ministry. A great woman of ministry, not just because Homs is in ministry, but God's calling you by himself. But he's saying this, every great woman of ministry is one that, yes, can heed their husband, but also can be the greatest strength to him by telling him where he's dirty, telling him where he's got mud behind his ears, tell him where he's lacking, tell him where he needs more Jesus in, in a loving, considerate, and sometimes prodding way, because we are thick-headed, and I believe God is calling you into that place, and that position of authority. You're not just following Hamza into the great beyond. You're being called out with Hamza into the presence and relationship with deep place of God and God the Father is saying this God the Father is saying this God the Father loves your family God the Father loves your family and he loves the family that you're going to have and right now is where you and Hamza begin and the reason I believe he's telling you this is because he is he understands men. He made us this way. We, we heed you guys a lot better than we do ourselves. But he's calling you to begin to curate the wedding. And I don't mean the ceremony. Curate the coming together. Curate the marriage that will be. Curating who you will be as a wife, who you will be as a husband. Not choosing your own adventure, but modeling it after the dimensions and patterns found in the scriptures of how God is the father of the church as a family, of the bride of his, the, the church as his bride, to begin to curate who you will be as a mother and who you will be as a father, to begin to get a vision for the household. And a vision for the household isn't just painting baby rooms. No, it's prophesying over the babies while they're sleeping in the rooms what God is going to do in their lives. But the thing is, Becca, you cannot prophesy what you are not hearing from him. So right now, your first step is this. Get low, stay low, and put an ear to his chest, girl. He's getting ready to speak to you. If anybody else has any words over anybody, just feel free to start moving. Start moving. I believe the Lord is speaking. I believe the word, the Lord has a word for Mandy and Wayne, but it's not on my lips than somebody else. So if you thought about Mandy and Wayne today, this is your chance. God's giving you license. Go for it.
Father, right now we just submit ourselves to you. And we get low as the worship team begins to sing Yeshua, God. That is our problem. That is our, that is our heartbeat of this moment. That is the thing that we are royally disturbed by, heavily disrupted by. That right now, God, our only problem is that we can't get the word Yeshua out of our mouths quick enough. It 